Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to the Candidate Forum for the Chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. This forum is sponsored by Inside Scoop TV and the League of Women Voters, a 103-year-old nonpartisan organization that never supports or opposes candidates or political parties. The forum is co-sponsored by 11 other nonpartisan organizations. I am Deborah Alpha Woolen, and I am the moderator. If you want to ask questions, call the number on the screen. We will use as many questions as possible in our allotted time. The candidates are Arthur Purvis and Jeffrey McKay. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening segment. The order was determined by the order on the ballot. After opening statements, candidates will answer questions and near the end of the forum, candidates will be allowed a one minute closing statement. Now, the opening statement from Arthur Purvis. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, good, good evening, everyone. I'm Arthur Purvis, the Republican candidate for chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. I thank the League of Women Voters, of which I'm a member, uh, for sponsoring us, and the co-sponsors, including the Fairfax NAACP, of which I'm also a member, for holding this forum. And it is a privilege to be here with Chairman McKay. I grew up in Washington, D.C. My late wife and I moved to Vienna in 1976. We have two children who attended Fairfax County Public Schools grades K through 12. I work 40 years as a computer programmer. I've been a scoutmaster, including for a small Latino troop, helped a refugee family with their asylum applications, was president of the Marshall High School lacrosse boosters and Thomas Jefferson High School crew boosters, served on the 2014 Fairfax County Meals Tax Task Force, and have been president of the Fairfax County Taxpayers Alliance for 26 years. For 20 years, the supervisors have been raising real estate taxes faster than our household income. What have we gotten in return? We've gotten more crime, a 27-point drop in SAT scores, a massive resignation of police, lockdowns, vaccine mandates, school closures, high gas prices, expensive groceries, the lowest commercial percentage of the real estate tax base in 39 years, a $350 million shortfall in, in WMATA's next operating budget, cuts to park staff, the premature shutdown of reliable, affordable fossil fuel plants, a mental health and fentanyl crisis, a diminished citizen voice in zoning, and elections corrupted by ballot harvesting. We have had four years of fear, fear for our safety, our health, our climate, and our economy. This performance does not justify the raise that the supervisors just gave themselves. I am running to create with you a Fairfax County that is safe and affordable for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Purvis. Now the opening statement from Mr. McKay. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. And it is an honor uh, to be with you tonight. And I also want to thank the League of Women Voters, uh, Channel 10, and, and all the folks who helped make this forum uh, happen tonight. It's an important part of democracy uh, to hear directly from your candidates. I'm a lifelong resident of Fairfax County, and I've had the honor and privilege to serve as the chairman of the Board of Supervisors for the last three and a half years, and before that for 12 years as the Franconia District Supervisor. I believe I have a very different worldview uh, than my opponent does, and I look back over the last th three and a half years, and I have to tell you that the experience I had in how to run a government and how to run it effectively has never been tested more like it was in the chaotic events of COVID-19 pandemic. Because of the way the county responded when people needed us most, we saved lives. We vaccinated more people than anyone else in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We saved small businesses. We supported people who were being evicted from their homes. And we provided critical health support for residents of our community. We also made progress on a lot of county priorities, from affordable housing to addressing climate change, mental health, support for public safety, I'm proud to be supported by our police, reducing gun violence, and funding our schools when they needed it most so that our kids could recover from COVID learning loss. I wanna thank Arthur for running for office because I think it's important to have choices in this election, but when it comes down to the issues, this is not an issue between Democrats and Republicans, it's an issue of a different worldview. 
one in which we think about the future of the county or one in which we want to look backwards to a county that was many, many decades ago. I'm proud of my record. I'm proud of what this Board of Supervisors has done in the most tasking of times, in the most difficult years we have ever experienced in Fairfax County, and we have come out on top. Thank you, and I ask you for your vote. Now for the, qu thank you so much, Mr. McKay. Now for the question and answer portion of this evening, starting with Mr. Purvis. To begin, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing Fairfax County, and how would you address that challenge? The biggest challenge facing Fairfax County is reading. Our public schools have not been teaching reading for decades. The most important years in a child's, uh, in a person's education is grades one through three, and if by third grade you have not mastered reading, uh, uh, you do not catch up, and you will be consigned to poverty and, and, and high at risk for crime uh, and, and welfare for the rest of your life. Uh, the, uh, and, and, and the problem was is that the, the, the public schools used a, a flawed reading curriculum called Whole Word uh, when they should have been teaching phonics. They're presumably making the change to phonics now, but a lot of damage has been done. I think a lot of, a lot of the hardships of welfare, the public safety issues we have, uh, affordable housing issues we have can all be traced back to having a large poverty class who counted on the public schools to teach them reading and they did not. The children who learned reading were the economically advantaged children who were, got supplemental help at home, but the economically disadvantaged children who were counting on the schools to teach them reading didn't learn there with that whole word picture-based reading program. And the tragedy of it is the children who did not learn how to read think it's their fault when in fact it was the fault of the school system. And, that, and the, the failure to teach reading leads to endless problems. Thank you, Mr. Purvis. Mr. McKay. Thank you very much. I think the biggest challenge facing the county is continuing our COVID recovery. Uh, we have been through a traumatic experience in the last couple of years. Uh, but because of the investments the county made and the forward thinking of the Board of Supervisors, we have rebounded very successfully. We have to continue this progress. Uh, we have more people working in Fairfax County than we had in 2019, an impressive statistic. More business establishments in the county than we had in 2019, and our economy is strong. One of the biggest challenges that every employer tells me is that the need for affordable housing is an absolute critical issue in the county, and that's why our board has prioritized affordable housing and invested in it. We have 130,000 vacant jobs in Fairfax County, in the Northern Virginia area, majority of them in Fairfax County. That tells me businesses want to be here because of our high-performing school system and the way county government is managed. But if we can't fill those jobs, businesses will leave, and we know that affordable housing is necessary to fill those jobs, and any employer will tell you that. Okay, thank you so much. Next question, starting with Mr. McKay. The Board of Supervisors develops a list of legislative priorities for the Fairfax County delegation to the General Assembly. What would be some of your legislative priorities? Uh, great question. First of all, school funding. The state is abysmal in school funding. In fact, a recent JLARC study showed that the state of Virginia invests less per pupil in public education than every one of our surrounding border states, including West Virginia and Kentucky. So we would have a shell of a public school system in Fairfax County if it weren't for local investment. The state has to increase their funding for public education so that local governments don't have to rely so much on real estate taxes to be able to pay for a high quality school system. Secondly, I think there's more work to be done with gun violence. You know, we are proud in Fairfax County to have supported the red flag law. It has removed over 100 guns from people who have, been, who have a past history of domestic violence and mental health. We have to stop the violence in Fairfax County and Virginia needs much stronger gun safety laws. So funding for education, gun safety laws, and finally, mental health. Mental health is another place where there's a lot of uh, work to be done at the state level to be able to support a robust mental health system. I'm very proud of the system that we have in Fairfax County and the services we provide people from diversion first to substance abuse treatment, but mental health is another dramatically underfunded need in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so my three as high priorities would be mental health funding, continued gun safety and, and violence reduction and real meaningful support of public education. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Mr. Purvis. 
Uh, so a high quality public, public school system. It's high quality for a few high schools, but for many high school it's low quality. The academic achievement varies a lot from high school to high school, and again, it's largely a result of the failure to teach reading and, and where you have affluent students. I think Jeff Matthews at the Washington Post said that all the SAT measures is how much money you have, and there's some truth to that because uh, the high SAT scores got extra tutoring at, at, at home to supplement the, uh, what was taught in schools. Uh, as far as, uh, as Virginia being behind in school funding, th this, uh, this line, I've been Taxpayer Alliance president for 26 years, and I've heard this line, I think, for, for 26 years. Some states fund their schools completely with state money. Some states fund their schools completely with local money. Uh, some states fund their schools half with uh, local money and half with state money. Virginia is in that third category. So yes, when you compare Virginia um, state uh, funding with other states, our state funding is rather low. But when you compare our local funding with other states, our local funding is rather high. So the bottom line is we end up in the middle. Okay, thank you, Mr. Purvis. We now have a question from our audience. Thank you so much for watching. This question is from Glenda and Burke. We are going to start with Mr. Purvis first. Regarding the Economic Mobility Pilot Program, do you believe it is effective and how would you fund it going forward? Um, the economic uh, the, the mobility pilot program. So I emailed the um, Office of, of Public Affairs and I said, could you please give me uh, the evaluation plan that will evaluate the effectiveness of, the, uh, of this mobility plan? And um, I, I got an answer which was really empty verbiage. It, it was, um, you know, it, it was vague. It was, you know, we're, we're going to support this, we're going to support that, we're going to integrate with other uh, programs. And so I emailed back and I said, can you please tell me what statistics you are going to gather and how you define your, how, how do you define success? Or how will you define su the success of this program? And I am still waiting for an answer. Uh, th this is just a So we, we hear that the county is making progress. Well, it makes, it's always making progress and never getting across the, uh, the finish line. The, the affordable housing, the supervisors started their affordable housing program in 1973. That is half a century ago. And I guess they've been making progress in affordable housing for half a century, but we still have a big problem. You know, and progress in climate and so forth, um, while it's making progress and never getting there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Purvis. Mr. McKay. Thank you. Well, I support the pilot program because one of the challenges we've had in Fairfax County, like many communities, is that we have overwhelming institutional poverty that affects people very differently. And it, it, it really is based on your place in life, where you were born into, what zip code you live in, and generational poverty has to stop. And so we at the county have to look at every, me every measure that we can to see what works in our community because we want to uplift all people. You know, I was born and raised in the Route 1 corridor, so I have seen the different corners of the county and the opportunities that exist in some corners of the county that don't exist in other parts of Fairfax County. And if we can give people a leg up through a pilot program and this improve that sustainable financial help will allow people to support child care and support transportation and some of the things that they need to be able to be successful, be able to work and lift their way out of poverty, then we might have an opportunity here to change a family's life. And so the point of this pilot is to look at the metrics, look the data come in and see whether or not it is making a difference in our communities who need it most. The truth is, this has happened across the country and other places, and the data that came back has proven that these types of programs can work. And so what we're trying to do is say, will this work on Fairfax County's turf? And if one thing we learned during COVID that's a huge takeaway is that it affected people differently. And if we don't rethink the way we support the most vulnerable people in our community, we will never help them in a meaningful way. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Next question, we're gonna start with Mr. McKay. There are many ways we can address climate and resource issues at the county level. 
These might include aspects of public transportation, maintaining tree cover, and transitioning to sustainable energy sources. What policies do you believe are working or what new policies would you propose? Thank you very much. Um, I believe in all of the above. I think we are in a race to address climate change in a way that our young people know is necessary to save the planet for future generations. Um, I'm proud to live in a county where people follow the science and they understand this and they turn out and they support uh, the very major initiatives that our board has put on the, on the table by a nine to one vote to support addressing climate change across the board. Our tree canopy goals have been exceeded uh, since I've been on the Board of Supervisors. We've started a zero waste program, established an environmental vision, pledged to be carbon neutral by 2040, launched CCAP, a way for the members of the community to get involved in addressing climate change through our climate action plan. We've electrified through a pilot program, uh, Fairfax connector buses, school buses. We've instituted a bag tax, which wasn't popular at the time, but I saw people collecting trash just this week and they told me what a huge difference it's made in cleaning up our environment and reducing plastics and reducing trash on our roadways in Fairfax County. This is probably one of the, if not the most important issues right now to residents of Fairfax County. And if we work together, we can address climate change and save our planet. And there's no place in Fairfax County for climate denying. And luckily, we live in a community that follows the science, they understand the urgency of the moment, and they support the issues that the county is doing to try to save our planet together. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Mr. Purvis. Well, we ought to agree where we can, and I certainly agree with uh, the tree canopy goal. And I certainly agree that we have a lot of institutional poverty, but the institutional poverty is caused by the flawed curriculum in our public school system. If, if you want to get people out of poverty, then teach them reading and teach them arithmetic. Um, now, with respect to the climate change, um, uh, Supervisor Walkinshaw just had a climate uh, 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 action conference on Saturday, where uh, the, the most important speaker, in my opinion, uh, presented misinformation. Uh, we, there was a, um, a panelist from George Mason University, a, a climate scientist, who showed a graph of, uh, of, of temperature, a temperature graph. And, and the increase in the last 20 years was steep. The increase was maybe four or five degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, so during the Q&A, I asked him, well, where do this, these temperatures come from? And it turns out they came from Reagan National Airport, which is a heat island. So then I asked him, well, what percentage of this temperature increase uh, was really due to, to climate change and how much of it was due to the fact it was simply at, at a heat island, or Reagan National Airport? His answer was, I don't know. So if you wanted to follow the science, you were not getting it at Supervisor Walkinshaw's conference. Okay, thank you, Mr. Purvis. Okay, next question, we will start with you, Mr. Purvis. What will you do to ensure all voters have equal access to the fundamental right to vote? You know, in the name of uh, the right to vote, you can destroy a person's right to vote by having uh, corrupt elections. And that is exactly what has happened in our, in, in our state with the drop boxes, with the ballot harvesting, with the election season. So yes, more people have a right to vote, but does their vote matter? Because it's manipulated so much. And I'll, I'll give you just one example. Uh, in the 2021 election, uh, in the uh, in-person election day vote, which is the most secure, uh, Governor Youngkin got 40% of the vote. But in the absentee ballot vote, he got 17% of the vote. Now, what explains the difference? We don't know, but I think there's an excellent chance that this was ballot harvesting, uh, people going out, finding people who, who normally wouldn't care about voting, and so to say, helping them with their ballots. Uh, there, I don't know of any way you can really enforce the law on that, but certainly uh, if we wanna, Democracy depends on elections we can trust. And that vote for Governor Yunkin raises a serious question whether we have an election system we can trust. And by the way, all this um, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, voting season has doubled the cost of elections from about $3 million to $6 million. By the way, I, as an election officer, let me pay tribute to the Office of Elections. They do a great job. It has been an honor to work with them. And, and okay, your mic is off. Thank you. Okay, Mr. McKay. Thank you very much. Um, I categorically and strongly disagree with 90% of what was just said, and I think it's dangerous. Fairfax County conducts free, fair, and safe elections. There's v election integrity matters in this county, and suggestions that it doesn't, I think, are reckless. We do want more people to vote. I want as many people to vote as possible, which is one of the reasons why the Board of Supervisors has supported all the efforts done in Richmond over the last couple years to make access to the ballot more available to folks. The truth is there is a disparity that exists between who votes. And we make elections really hard in this country, especially in Virginia. I was proud, as chairman of the board, to make election day a holiday for our own county employees so that they could volunteer to work elections, but more importantly, so that they could also exercise their right to vote. We live in a community where people are busy. Working parents have a lot on their hands. I know that, I have that with my own two kids. The easier we can make it for people to vote is an important exercise in promoting democracy. Does it cost more? Yes, it does cost more, Arthur, but democracy isn't cheap and it shouldn't be able to be bought. Having more people vote and having it cost more to have more people participate in their government is a fundamental right that people have that we should always be supporting. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Okay, next question again is from our audience. A follow-up qu question again from Glenda and Burke. Thank you so much, Glenda. Okay, we're gonna start with Mr. McKay here. If the economic mobility pilot program is approved, how would it be funded? Well, I support it, um, and the initial funds are being used from ARPA funds that were given to us by the federal government. One of the stipulations of ARPA funds that has been important to me is ways that we can harden our community for future things that occur like COVID. And one of the ways to do that, at the very beginning of COVID, we saw the disparity, how lower income people were being hurt more who were getting infected at a higher rate, who didn't have the luxury of working from home like a lot of other people did. And we said these disparities that exist with overcrowding, cramped quarters for people who are living in poverty, access to childcare was cut off for a lot of people. Um, and, and we looked across the country and said, hey, many cities and counties have had success with this economic mobility pilot program. Why not use some of our federal ARPA funds to make a real difference, to test this, to see if it can change people's lives and lift them up so that if we do get hit with something like another pandemic, people in our community will be better prepared. And so it will be federally funded ARPA funds that the county has uh, that is available for this. As I said earlier, I support this because I think we have to look at every creative means possible to try to address generational poverty in Fairfax County. And this is one of the tools uh, that has been brought forward by our staff as a creative way to deal with that. And again, I support it. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Mr. Purvis. So again, this generational poverty is the product of our three and a half billion dollar school system, which by um, uh, uh, not teaching properly in the most important years of a child's education denies a significant, uh, denies our most vulnerable children a chance at the American dream. And the lockdowns, uh, the lockdowns were a two Fairfax policy, right? Because the economically disadvantaged were sequestered in crowded apartment buildings. They were the ones who, uh, who, who lost most of the jobs because they were in the service sector where the more affluent could be in their homes and, and, and lost fewer of their jobs. Uh, the, the lockdowns were, were very uh, unfair, very unequal. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Purvis. Next question, we're gonna start with you, Mr. Purvis. How can public safety be improved in Fairfax County? Well, I think there are three things um, contributing to our, uh, our, our deteriorating public safety. And the first thing, big surprise, the poverty created by the public school system by not teaching reading. Folks, Turns out education is important, okay? Turns out that reading is really, really important, okay? Uh, and, and so we, we have a Commonwealth attorney who, whose goal has been to re 
uh, eliminate the disproportionate uh, incarceration of, um, of blacks and, and, and Latinos. And, and that's a worthy goal. That, uh, I agree with the goal, okay? But if you really want to achieve that goal, then Mr. Descano should be a champion of fixing the reading, because a lot of these, these uh, uh, persons who are caught in, in, in the legal system, they aren't able to get a job because they haven't been adequately prepared by the public school system. And the other, I think the other big contributor to crime is the climate alarmism and the ESG policies, which have driven up the price of gasoline, you know, four and five dollars a gallon, and have driven up the price of food and groceries and, and just made life unaffordable. And, and I think it has driven up a black market, and I think that has driven up um, uh, shoplifting. Uh, so between, you know, if, if you want to eliminate crime, go to the roots. Let's fix reading. Let's get the... Okay, thank you, Mr. Purvis. Mr. McKay. Thank you very much. So there's a lot of pieces here to crime. First, um, as, I, as I have mentioned many times to our community just a few weeks ago, the Major City Chiefs Association, which is a police organization, once again certified Fairfax County as the safest jurisdiction of its size in the United States of America. We have the best public safety officials any community could ever ask for right here in Fairfax County. And so while rising crime is a national trend, we've been able to buck that in a lot of categories in Fairfax. But I think crime is only part of the story. We need to also address mental health. We need to address dangerous weaponry that people have that create crimes that are crimes of passion in many times. And we need to support things like Diversion First, a program that we have in place that tries to help people who have been arrested for nonviolent offenses who are suffering from mental health challenges to get the kind of support and rehab that they need. We don't need people sitting in jails. We need people to get rehabilitation so that they can contribute to our economy in Fairfax County. And so I'm very proud of the very forward-thinking work that's been done on police reform and the embrace that our police department has had to be a best practices police department. And I'm very proud of the response that we have that has violent crime in many categories down in Fairfax County. So we do have to follow this closely because of the national trends, but I'm proud of where we are today and we'll continue to work on this. Fantastic. So we have 55 seconds left. Obviously, that's not enough time for both of you to be able to answer a question. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to ask a question. It's rather long, but it's going to give you both time to think about it over the break. So in Northern Virginia, direct care workers make $16.45 an hour, and there is more than 50% turnover annually, making it difficult to provide continuity in services and threatening the quality of care. This critical workforce dispropor disproportionately made up of women of color does vital tasks to support people with disabilities in their communities. How would we get ahead of this challenge and ensure everyone can live and age in place with a disability because they can find appropriate caregivers? Please make sure you don't go anywhere. Come back as we continue our conversation with the candidates for the chairman of the Board of Supervisors for Fairfax County. You made your house a reality. Homeschooling yourself on loans, color coding listings, and flushing every toilet in a 20 mile radius. If you can ace house hunting, you can do it for retirement. Get on track with tips at aceyourretirement.org. Here's to the things that can keep us safe. Those we use all the time with hardly a thought. Those that are silently standing by to save our lives. And now, those that we carry with us everywhere we go. Many mobile devices will now bring you wireless emergency alerts, real-time information directly from local sources you know and trust. With the unique sound and vibration, you'll be in the know. Listen, I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you judge me for having a problem. No one is going to know that I need help. I need help. I know that no one is going to judge me for having a problem. I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you listen.
Open road, here comes the Hefley family. Whether it's a short trip or a long haul. Estimated time, 47 hours. They will beg. You're hungry? I'm happy to provide. They will plead. Deep, Deep fried, fried butter, butter on, on a stick. stick. But whatever you do, don't wimp out. Now you're talking? Make them buckle up. They can't hurt. Remember, safety first. Cheese curls. Second. Are you orange? We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. And thank you so much for coming back and joining us for the candidate forum for the chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. We have with us candidate, the Republican candidate, Mr. Arthur Purvis, and the Democratic candidate, Mr. Jeffrey, Jeffrey McKay. So I'm going to start the last question again um, because it's rather long. So here we go, and we're going to start off with uh, Mr. McKay answering. In Northern Virginia, direct care workers make $16.45 per hour, and there is more than 50% turnover annually, making it difficult to provide continuity in services and threatening the quality of care. This critical workforce, disproportionately made up of women of color, does vital tasks to support people with disabilities in their communities. Despite this work, their value is not reflected in wages forcing them to work long hours and multiple jobs just to get by. How do we get ahead of this challenge and ensure everyone can live and age in place with a disability because they can find appropriate caregivers? Well, that's a great question. Uh, first, I think we have challenges across this nation and indeed right here in Fairfax County and not paying people living wages to be able to support uh, their lifestyle. And so number one, um, I'm proud to have organized labor support in this campaign because one of the missions of organized labor is to make sure we pay people a living wage and to make sure that they have rights and they have health care and they have benefits so that they can thrive in our community. I also have been a strong supporter of things like uh, pre-K and, chi and child care uh, subsidies for families who have children so that they also can be contributing members of our workforce. But we have to value these folks. You know, I hear a lot about education here tonight, but I think one of the biggest challenges with these jobs, direct care support workers and people like teachers, is they're under a tremendous amount of unnecessary stress. And as a community, we have to support their work, support their pay, ensure they get a living wage, make sure that we have affordable housing and childcare opportunities to be able to support them and their families in very stressful work. Look, the aging is happening in Fairfax County, the aging of our population and the need for these, including the need for them, people who are suffering from intellectual disabilities, is very high right now. We also need to work with our community colleges to help them be able to certify more quickly and get people involved in this work, especially our young people coming out of school to ha create a pipeline uh, for future employees to do this critical work. Okay, thank you, Mr. McKay. Mr. Purvis? So uh, I agree with everything uh, Chairman McKay just said, but what he didn't say is how he would uh, fund the, the problem, where, where, how he would actually raise the salaries. And this uh, leads to Medicaid waivers. Uh, Medicaid waivers are uh, a, a government program which gives families uh, a, a subsidy from the uh, federal government, I think, maybe there's some from the state, to help pay for care in the home. And this is a good case study of the problems of socialism and the problems of government-provided pre-K and the problems of government-provided childcare and the problems of government-provided everything, the government-provided affordable housing. You always end up with a shortage. There is not enough money. And in the case of Medicaid waivers, the state has a backlog of, I think, 14,000 Medicaid waivers, okay? There's a waiting list of 14,000 people trying to get a Medicaid waiver. And in the last budget, uh, state budget, the Governor Youngkin and, and, the, and the General Assembly made a historical investment in, mental, in, in, in this care by funding 1,100 waivers. Um, Families have to be self-sufficient. If you rely on the government, you're going to be on a five-year waiting list. And you'll never guess my solution to self-sufficiency. Thank you, Mr. Purvis. Okay, next question, starting with you. What law enforcement issues should be addressed in Fairfax County? 
th thank you for, for having another question about law enforcement. Uh, safest is not the same as safe. You know, the safest place on a battlefield is not necessarily safe. And as far as Fairfax County doing better, since uh, Mr. Descano, again, whose goals I sympathize with, okay? It's, a, it's the implementation that where there's a question. But since he's been Commonwealth Attorney, uh, larcenies uh, went up 24%, uh, auto theft went up 62%, robberies up 30%, uh, assaults up 12%. There was a WJLA article about shoplifting going up, uh, uh, I think, 47% uh, since last year. And uh, I emailed the police department to get the source of the, of the article, because uh, the article showed a picture of a police document. And the email I got back was to go to the police home page, which I had done, and, and I couldn't find it. Uh, but to address crime, I've already mentioned it. Uh, the schools, our $3 billion school system has to stop perpetuating class differences, has to stop perpetuating poverty. <laughs> We have this one um, uh, Fairfax policy. My opponent and I would agree. Inequality is the poison of the body politic. Inequality is, is, is poison. But that one Fairfax policy should have included phonics and math in third grade. Thank you, Mr. Purvis. Mr. McKay? Uh, thank you very much. You know, I've mentioned a lot of things already. I think, you know, the national trends with crime are concerning. Um, why the Major City Chiefs Association designated Fairfax the way they did is because violent crimes are exceptionally low in Fairfax County. We have seen a rise in property crimes, and a lot of that is due to inflation. A lot of it is due to retailers who don't uh, prosecute shoplifters. The, the shoplifting issue, uh, Arthur, there's a few establishments in, the Fair, in Fairfax County, a few retail establishments that represent the vast majority of those shoplifting cases. And so our police have worked very closely with those retailers to make sure that they are agreeing to take action against those people uh, who are arrested as well. But law enforcement starts with a well-trained police department. And as I said earlier, I'm proud that our police department has embraced modern policing techniques that have put us in a position to continue to be the safest jurisdiction. I realize it's campaign time and we want to scare a lot of people, uh, but the reality of the situation is Fairfax County is the safest place in Virginia and by a lot of measures in the country uh, to be able to live. And a lot of that is because of the sophisticated training and support that our men and women in law enforcement get so that they can get on top of crimes when they happen and most importantly, they can provide justice for victims. But again, this is a holistic issue that we have to deal with involving mental health, weapons, training of police officers, and being proud of our forward-thinking police policies and practices in the county. Okay. Your mic is off. Thank you. So, okay, starting with another question, but again in the realm of law enforcement um, and policing, disadvantaged communities, including those with disabilities and people of color, are overrepresented in jails and prisons. What would you propose to address this issue? Well, there's a lot of things I've proposed and things that we're already doing in Fairfax County. Let's start with the fact that our police department should look like our community. And we have hired more women, more minority recruits than ever before in Fairfax County, people who are multilingual. So, you know, in order to promote a safe community, people have to feel safe in their community and be willing to and comfortable talking to the police. And so having a department that looks like Fairfax County is critical. Secondly, uh, we have started a co-responder model so that people who are suffering from mental health challenges can call the police and get the support that they need and issues can be de-escalated so that people can be heading towards treatment instead of heading towards incarceration. I think that's an important part of policing in, in this century and certainly an important thing we've learned in Fairfax County about the disproportionality of people who get arrested by race, by disability, and there are ways to address uh, those issues. And I think we're on the right track in Fairfax County and doing all of those things uh, with the help of the community. We've had a lot of community groups involved in this, disability advocacy groups, uh, NAACP, uh, ACLU, a lot of organizations that have pointed to these disproportionate numbers and ways that we can address them, and we are doing just that in Fairfax County. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Mr. Purvis. Um, so this is, this is no surprise, 
I, I lay the, the inequality and um, the disproportionate incarceration of, of economically disadvantaged right at the feet of our $3.5 billion school system run by, it's a monopoly where if the children don't get an education, if, if some schools do, do well and other schools do poorly, it's a monopoly and all the administrators uh, still get their, their, their pay. And, and there's a lot of administrators too, right? There's uh, 124 coordinators, 107 functional supervisors, 125 instructional specialists, um, to, to, to name a few. And yet with all these experts, the school <laughs> board wanted to spend $6 million to hire an outside consultant to come up with strategies to close the minority student uh, achievement gap. Well, if we have to hire outside consultants to solve that problem, what are we paying all of these uh, administrators for? Um, so, yeah, e education is, uh, well, here's one way of looking at it. Uh, this has been mentioned to me a couple of times, including by um, uh, Dr. Reed, that uh, when they plan uh, prison construction, they look at third grade demographics. Okay, thank you, Mr. Purvis. Next question, starting with Hugh. What are you doing to make sure qualified people with disabilities are a part of your campaign team and permanent staff? Oh my gosh, I have to confess I have no campaign team. and I, I am the permanent staff. Um, I think my opponent has raised $500,000, a lot of which was spent on your primary. Uh, that's one of the advantages of being a Republican, right? I, I didn't have to face a primary to, to become the <laughs> Republican nominee. Um, so I don't, I don't have staff. I'm, I'm basically doing this on my own. I've raised $3,000, put in 3,000 of my own money. Um, but I'll, this is a little off question, but this is my seventh run for office. It's just an expensive way to try to lobby my chairman. Uh, and, uh, but the first time I ran was in 1995. And my friend down the street, Rob McDowell, ran for state senate. He spent, he raised and spent $160,000. I raised and spent $16,000. In the 15, he had phone banks, consultants. We got um, demonized mailings of, uh, you know, photo photographs, uh, demonized photographs of his opponent. Uh, he was endorsed by the governor. On election day in the 15 precincts we ran together, he got 41% of the vote and I got 40% of the vote. I, I really think that the voters are really more interested in issues and I don't think they're beguiled very much by all the signs and ads and, and that stuff. Thank you, Mr. Purvis. Mr. McKay. Uh, well, your question was about uh, dis folks with disabilities and supporting them. And, you know, I'm proud of the professional staff that I have in Fairfax County that looks like Fairfax County in many ways. Um, is faced with the daily challenges of many people in our community and bring that perspective uh, to my office. We have always been open to hiring people with disabilities, not just in my office, but I'm pretty proud of the progress we've made in Fairfax County uh, doing that as well. And I've worked with a lot of organizations like MVLE and Service Source to try to provide support in Fairfax County for people with intellectual disabilities to be able to get jobs and worked with them on linking them up to employers who will hire people with disabilities, which should be every employer uh, in Fairfax County. And so I'm, I'm pretty proud of the record that we've had. Um, despite what you've just heard about the campaign, I have two part-time campaign uh, staff people uh, that I've had with me since I first ran for office uh, who do amazing work and are out there in the disability community, again, supporting that community. I'm proud to have a cadre of supporters of my campaign who have various disabilities. And the truth of the matter is, is I think all of us will live long enough to experience a disability of some type. And we need to be cognizant of that and support this population of people to live a life like yours, like the ARC says. That's a simple thing that they want to do, live a life like yours. And in order to do that, they need jobs and we need to support the hiring of them. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Next question. Fairfax County is considering changing the minimum parking requirements for off-street parking to reduce the number of parking spaces. This will impact businesses and townhouse, apartment, and condo communities. There has been much pushback from residents about this proposed change to the zoning ordinance. What are your thoughts? 
Well, I voted for it. It's already been adopted in Fairfax County. Um, I voted along with every other member of the Board of Supervisors who supported this. Uh, there were also a lot of folks who very much supported uh, the new parking regulations. From an environmental standpoint, if you go across Fairfax County, and I walk through one of these every day, and there's one right in front of the government center, a sea of unused asphalt that could be used for much, much more productive things, affordable housing, green space. Um, you know, our parking codes hadn't changed in Fairfax County for half a century. I mean, we're a very different place today than we were 50 years ago. Um, that being said, um, I, d I supported a modified version of the parking uh, regulations that support additional parking, um, not the full amount of reduction in residential areas because I do hear from communities, especially townhome and condo multifamily communities, about parking challenges. And so I think we have to treat residential and commercial very different. But we also have to think about pedestrian safety. We've had far too many pedestrian deaths in Fairfax County. We have to think about the car-dominated components that bring about those deaths and think about how we can look at our zoning ordinance as a way to build a more walkable, a more green, a more modern uh, community in Fairfax County. And that's why I and every other member of our board supported this modest change and will continue to monitor it. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Mr. Purvis. Um, uh, first of all, I want to commend my opponent for his comments about the, the disadvantaged and uh, an end diversion first. We, we certainly uh, agree on that. Um, so my understanding of parking reimagined was that it was going to create a shortage of parking places in, in housing developments. And it sounds like that that was the modification that was made, and so that problem is presumably resolved. Um, you know, as far as excess asphalt and, and so forth, uh, uh, I, would, I would agree on that. But I do feel that um, uh, generally the county has an anti-road, anti-car bias uh, based on this uh, 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 climate alarmism. Um, and, and, and so going to, to the climate alarmism for a second, uh, if you go to the UN's IPCC website and look at their synthesis report six, that's their latest evaluation of, uh, of, of climate knowledge, they have headlines. And on the headlines, it says that temperatures have increased two degrees Fahrenheit over the last 140 years. Talking about following the science. In the headlines, there's no prediction of what the uh, temperature will be at 2100, and, and your 2100, and there's no comment even about sea level rise. And, and this is the UN, right? Um, so I really think a lot of this climate alarmism is overblown and is having devastating. Okay, so staying in the realm of the environment, Mr. Purvis, there are many different agencies within the county that have a role in overseeing new development and in protecting our natural resources. How can the county better coordinate efforts between Soil and Water Commission, Zoning and Planning Committee and the urban forester to protect our existing tree canopy? Well, th that question sort of makes me wish I were uh, my opponent who's worked full time in county government for almost 30 years. So um, uh, I'll, I'll just make some general comments uh, about the environment and, and that has to do with increased uh, density, okay? Uh, if we're going to have affordable housing, we need a lot more than the 10,000 units that they're making progress on, but which according to the uh, Fairfax Healthy Community Survey is not funded and, and is short. They need 15,000. Other people say we need 45,000 more units. But for us to really have an affordable housing in this county, the residents have to agree to higher densities. And I think we need to make it a priority and have a, a countywide conversation about this instead of including residents in this conversation after a plan is made. The, the residents of Rose Hill were surprised by a, a plan to uh, convert their uh, uh, shopping center to um, higher density housing. They, they should have been included from the beginning. And residents have a lot of concerns about increased density. They're, they're concerned about uh, traffic. They're concerned about infrastructure, sewer, water. They're concerned about the impact on the schools. They're, in, they're concerned about in, you know, increased densities might bring more crime. I think all of these can be resolved, but they've got to be brought to the forefront. If I were chairman, having a countywide conversation with HOAs on this topic starting at the bottom. 
Thank you, Mr. Purvis. Mr. McKay. Uh, thank you. Well, first, I'm, I'm proud of my 30 years of service to Fairfax County. Um, I, I will say with regard uh, to this question, I think citizen involvement is key to the success in Fairfax County. And so while we have a lot of committees and opportunities for ways to volunteer, we have a very diverse population in Fairfax County of people of over one million residents. And citizen engagement and ways for them to shape county policies is vital. And so I don't support collapsing some of these organizations. I think there are groups like EQAC that do a good job bringing together a lot of issues from the Tree Commission and some of the other uh, groups in Fairfax County. But the, the magnitude of our climate challenges requires us to look at all of these issues and to have as many citizens engaged as possible. Uh, one of the things I'm very proud of that we instituted during COVID was to allow people to call in and testify at Board of Supervisors meetings by telephone live so that they don't have to drive all the way to the government center so that, that, so that we're hearing from people who don't necessarily have the time and energy to take time off of work to be able to communicate with county government. And so I think these boards, authorities, and commissions do great work. I think they coordinate their plans in a lot of ways to the environmental plans that I mentioned before. Uh, things like CCAP, our environmental vision, those are documents that are built by the citizens, by the boards, authorities, and commissions, and by the input that we get, and we have to continue that. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Let's go back to affordable housing for a bit. Based on the missing middle study in Arlington, the Arlington County Board changed their zoning ordinance to promote affordable housing. Will the construction of more apartments and townhouses change Fairfax County in a negative way? Uh, I don't think so. I think the magnitude of our affordable housing is challenges are so large that we need as many toolbox in our toolbox as possible, as many tools in our toolbox as possible. Um, I mentioned earlier there are 130,000 vacant jobs right now, um, and those jobs have to be filled by people who can afford to live here. And so one of the reasons why we've been supporting affordable housing for as long as we have been and, and making meaningful investments in it is because we need to make progress uh, on that front. And until we do, we're going to have economic challenges ahead. Uh, we also need to, from a climate perspective, have people be able to live closer to where they work. Uh, having affordable housing in Prince William or Loudoun and having people drive all the way into Fairfax every day is not good for their stress, it's not good for their mental health, it's certainly not good for the environment. And so I think we have to rethink the way we're doing housing. Uh, we did uh, rewrite the entire zoning ordinance. And I think one of the things that people forget in that zoning ordinance is we allow accessory dwelling units now to be created in single family homes, which allow folks to be able to have someone else share in the cost of their home without doing anything to the exterior of their building. So in effect, by one action, we potentially could have doubled the number of affordable housing units above the number of housing units in, in Fairfax County right now. And so I think this is an approach that we need to look at all the tools that are available to us. Uh, there are elements of what Arlington did that I don't support. Uh, we need to be able to protect our suburban neighborhoods, but we can do that and still build affordable housing. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Mr. Purvis. Um, so with, res uh, with respect to citizen input, um, Actually, the Z-Mod and the uh, accessory uh, unit uh, modification uh, received quite a bit of criticism from the community because uh, citizen input was, um, was eliminated. It used to be that that sort of thing would require a hearing, but now uh, th those accessory units can be administratively approved. Uh, and also, um, uh, citizen input was uh, removed for um, home-based businesses. And citizen input was removed for um, data centers in, in certain uh, zoned areas. Um, so uh, yes, we, we need citizen in input. Now, th the question had to do, w w if we had a missing middle policy, would it, you know, uh, how, how would it affect Fairfax County? Would it be a big change? The answer has to do with the perceptions of the people. Of, of the citizens, do they have buy-in? If you're going to do so, well, we need more housing. I, 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 I sympathize and understand uh, Chairman McKay's um, support for a, a, a these accessory units, okay? But they should not have bypassed the, the citizen input. And I think if you have the citizen input, you can work through the objections, give, you know, give, get, listen to the objections, uh, uh, address the objections, um, Think of it if the shoe were on the f other foot. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Purvis and Mr. McKay. We have now reached the end of the QA portion of tonight's show. Now, each candidate has the opportunity for a one minute closing statement in reverse order of the opening statement, which means we will start with Mr. McKay. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to have a conversation. Um, I don't want to take too much of my minute, but what Mr. Purvis said was just not correct a moment ago. We had over 60 meetings on Parking Reimagine and a public hearing uh, with 30 speakers. I was there, if you remember. Um, but I think we need to be thinking about this campaign about two different worldviews. You've heard two different worldviews here. Uh, one that is focused on the future of Fairfax County and attacking real problems, and one that is really focused on something that was decades ago. And so this election uh, has two stark contrasts, and, and that's great for democracy. And I hope people get out there and vote. I hope they see tonight's forum. I thank the League of Women Voters and Channel 10 for having us here tonight, and I hope that you will support me and that I can count on your vote so that we can continue to make progress in Fairfax County on these issues that are important to us. It has been an honor to serve as your chairman, even during the most difficult of times. Thank you. Mr. Purvis. Uh, I need to correct the correction. Uh, I did not say that there were no hearings on parking reimagined. I said there were no hearings on the changes slipped into the ZMOD for the uh, accessible uh, accessory units and for the home-based businesses. That's where the hearings were missing. Um, yeah, you have heard two worldviews. You know, one worldview is that the government will solve everything. The government will give you affordable housing, child care, Medicaid waivers, a great education, uh, and, and just look, you, you've paid higher taxes and everything has gotten worse. Um, the, the county uh, faces many challenges in, in addressing them. I think we need to remember that a county is no stronger than its families. Its families are built on relationships, and relationships uh, are, are hard to, to do. That requires uh, self-discipline and, and, and compassion and empathy and, and patience. Um, and I think we... Okay, thank you so much to Mr. McKay and Mr. Purvis for joining us tonight hosted by the League of Women Voters for tonight's candidate forum. So with one minute left, for anyone who watches the Inside Scoop, you know I like to do a little bit, a little something different at the end of each show. So we're gonna do something called either or. You get one answer, no explanation. So starting with Mr. Purvis, um, waffles or pancakes? Waffles, sourdough waffles. Okay. Pancakes. Pancakes, okay. Top Gun or Indiana Jones? Definitely Top Gun. Neither. Neither, okay. Um, let's see, Commanders or Caps? Commanders. The Commanders, okay. Definitely Caps. <laughs> the Caps, okay. And one more, book or a movie? Book. Book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Please make sure you go out and vote this November. Have a wonderful evening, and thank you again for joining us for the Candidate Forum for the Chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. Have a wonderful evening, and thank you again for your time.